until Jesus returns, which could be in just a moment, or he calls us home, which also could be in, in any moment. This is our stand, baby. This is us. We stand for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection power. I am excited about our Lord who lives and reigns in our world and in this life. I'm excited to be here with all of you. We have baptized people for four weeks in a row. That's exciting. I love it that, 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 that our Lord is moving and he's drawing people to him. We're seeing him move in the lives of children and adults, young and old. The Lord is alive. We are going to start a sermon series today called At the Table with Jesus, and uh, we're going to take the Lord's Supper five weeks in a row. And the way that we're going to do it is, is every way that we take it is going to be different, and it's going to reflect the theology and the teaching that morning, because truly the Lord's Supper is just so deep, and, and there's so much symbolism to it. There's no way that just one sermon can encapsulate everything that it means. And so each time that I preach, the, the theme of that morning, it, it, we're going to take the Lord's Supper in a way that's like it. For instance, this morning at the table with Jesus, the, the, the title of the message is called Homecoming. And how do we take the Lord's Supper in a way that represents homecoming? Well, rather than pass all of the plates out to you, we're going to invite you to come home, come home and take it up here at the very end. Um, next week, we're going to do it differently. The week after that, we're going to do it in a really neat, special way. Let, let me tell you, on the third week, we want you to talk all that week with your family about uh, uh, the most important or the most delicious meals that your family likes. And we want you to do the Lord's Supper at your house after worship. I'm going to give you all a script. We're going to pass it out when you come on that morning, and you can take it home with you. And, and then when you go home, whatever your favorite meal is that y'all do well together, it could be Salisbury steak and mashed potatoes, it could be pancakes. What is your favorite meal that your family loves and cherishes? Because that morning I'm going to be preaching and talking about it. And, uh, and, and that day you go home and you do the Lord's Supper as a family. And then on the fourth Sunday... You do the same thing. You have a meal at your house, but this time it's different. You're going to invite church members. You're going to invite people from the outside. Find people that will make your table full. All of the seats at your table, may they be full four weeks from now. And you also do a meal that day at your house after the worship service. And then on the last day, um, the fifth Sunday, we're going to do the Lord's Supper as an entire church family, a full meal at the Highland Lakes Baptist Encampment. And we're, it's going to be a unique way that we do it, and I'm excited about it. But today, homecoming. Turn your Bibles with me, please, to Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, verse 11. Luke 15, and you are welcome to stand if you would like as we read God's word together. Luke 15, 11. All right, however your week has been, whatever is on your heart and mind right now, try to release all of it and allow the word of God to speak to you. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. And so the father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in great need. And so he went off and he hired himself out as a, in the, as a citizen in that country who sent him, there was a citizen in that country who sent him into the fields to feed his pigs. Now, y'all, we don't have time to get into the cultural implications of that, but this young man is a Jew, 
Do Jews like pigs? No, 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 no. And you find a young man now who has gone to another place and he is feeding the pigs and it gets worse than that. It says, and he longed to fill his stomach with the food that the pigs were eating. A Jew, not just with pigs, but eating with the pigs. It doesn't get any lower and uh, because no one gave him anything to eat. Verse 17, he came to his senses and he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death, eating with the pigs. I will set out and I will go back to my father. And I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven, against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father who was waiting and watching for him, was filled with compassion when he saw him. And he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And then he said, the son, son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, bring... Uh, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast. Let's have a feast. Let's celebrate for this son of mine. And this is one of the most famous passages in the Bible. This son of mine who was dead is now alive. He was lost and now he's found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard all the music and the dancing. And so he called one of his servants and he asked him, what in the world is going on? And, and they said, your brother, your brother has come home. He replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf and, because he has him back safe and sound. The other brother rejoiced and was happy. No. The older brother became very angry. Now, y'all, here's how you become angry so fast, if you're already angry. This man, this brother, he had been out in the fields, and this had been festering in him for a long, long time. It's not as if he's a happy guy, and he just comes in, and all of a sudden, that's not it. This kind of anger is a thing that sets deep down inside of him. And because of it, he refused to go in to the party. You can be so mad that you miss the party. So his father went out and he pleaded with him. But this guy answered his father and he said, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. He sees the dad as a, not as a father, right? Not as a father. He sees the dad as a boss. And he says, I'm, I'm your slave I'm, I'm, I'm just following your orders, and yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with his friends. But when your son, this son of yours, who has squandered his property, your property on prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him? And the dad said, my son, you, you're always with me, and, and everything I have is yours. What a generous dad. But we, we had to do this. We had to celebrate um, and be glad because this brother of yours was dead he was dead and now he's alive he was lost and now he is found is not that the most beautiful story you've ever heard it's so ridiculously good and i'm pumped to talk about it heavenly father be with us now as we explore this in light of the lord's supper help it to teach us about the supper Help us to understand what the supper means and embrace it through Luke 15, the story of the prodigal. Be with us now, O oh Lord. Be with all of those who are home watching. We love you very, very much, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we are taking a very deep look into all that God intends for the Lord's Supper to be. Uh, 
And, and people call this the Lord's Supper, but what are some other names for it? We call it communion, don't we? We, we call it the Eucharist. We call it all kinds of things like that. I, I call this series At the Table with Jesus. Um, fairly regularly, somebody asks me questions about the Lord's Supper. Can our children partake in the Lord's Supper even if they haven't been baptized, Pastor Ross? Can, uh, 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 how often should we take it? Um, they say, can somebody participate in it even if they're not a member of our church? Can somebody participate in it even if they are very distant from God? Can somebody participate in it even if they struggle with God? Can, when we do it, how formal does it have to be? When we do it, are, are, are we being serious enough with it? Or some people have said, no, when we take it, are we being too serious and making too much formality and losing the intimacy of what it means to be a family of faith and like a meal over it? I had a teenager in our church said, uh, uh, Ross, when we do the Lord's Supper and you pass it out, is it only deacons who are allowed to pass it out? Could I pass it out one day? Yes, by the way, you, you, you can. We ask all of these questions about it, and I suppose the good thing about people asking that is that Christians at least feel that the Lord's Supper is important and that they feel like God has commanded it, and so all these questions represent a heart's desire that they just, they just want to get it right. And, and I have good news for any of you who, who fret about that. When you do the Lord's Supper, as long as you keep Jesus Christ at the center of it and, and as long as you have this desire that, that, that everybody around you, that everybody in our world even, are so valuable to the kingdom of God that your heart's desire is for them to be welcome at the table too. If you get Jesus right, and if you have love as you're taking this for other people, y'all, you, you really cannot mess up the Lord's Supper. Uh, you, you can't. Uh, it, it's because Jesus has already done it. It's kind of like how I get real stressed out before Easter, and I think, oh, goodness, if I preach a bad sermon, I'm going to mess up Easter. And Megan reminds me, Jesus is risen, dude. The, uh, the, uh, you, 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 can't, you, you can't mess up Easter. It's a victory with or without you. Uh, in that same vein, I, I think that if, we, if you do the Lord's Supper well, it means Jesus is at the center of it and people are so valuable, I want them at the table with me. Now, one of the things I love about it is, is that, and I've seen this over and over, the Lord's Supper is about homecoming. Uh, the idea of being in a very loving home with people who care about you, with God, and you're at this table together, and you're laughing, and you're telling stories, and you're sharing blessings, and, and you're just enjoying the company of everybody there. The Lord's Supper is about that. And, and in the Gospel of John, Jesus is trying to help his apostles understand that. And so they're all there, and, and right after he has washed their feet, now they're all eating together, and, and Jesus says to them, now if any of you love me, and, and if you love God and you will obey him, then guess what? God loves, and he doesn't call him God, he says the Father. The Father loves you, and the Father is going to make himself at home with you. Uh, now, now fixate on the word home. God wants to be home with you. The Father calling people home, coming to your home, being with you. There's this intimacy of home surrounding the dinner. And, and, and that is an important part of what we're doing. And when we learn uh, here that the Lord's Supper always then has this, this potentiality that when we do it, you, you, you kind of feel like you're being called home. And I know that doesn't surprise all of you because how often have, have we done the Lord's Supper and, uh, and, 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 and you might not feel spiritually close to God in that moment. Maybe you've had a wreck of a week, maybe a wreck of a decade, and, and, and you feel very distant from God. You haven't prayed in a long time. You, you, you're not in scripture. You're, you're not in Bible study. All kinds of things have slowly dragged and pushed you away from the Lord. But all of a sudden, the preacher stands up and he holds this bread and he quotes the living God. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And now all of a sudden, you who are distant feel like God is calling you home. 
This is my body which is broken for you. Come, come, get it, take it in remembrance of me. And now somebody who was running away from God, they hear Jesus speaking, hey, hold on, this is my body. And you turn around and they say, and it's broken for you. There is something about Jesus' voice. This is my blood poured out for you. And even the person who's running away from the Lord is drawn back to him. It's kind of like that story of, of the two teenage boys who lived in an English coastal town. And on one sun, Sunday, they decided to skip church and get on their horses and, and, and ride in the opposite direction of the church. And so when their families and everyone was going to church, they plotted with one another, we're gonna sneak away and we're gonna get on our horses and ride away and play hooky and we're gonna go have fun and go away. And so just before worship began, the church bell started to ring as it did every Sunday in that particular little town. But the boys weren't going the direction of the bells. They were going in the opposite direction. They got on their horses, and as fast as they could, they're going in the opposite way. And at the beginning, the church bells were very loud, and they could hear it. But the further and further they got away on the horses, you know, they're a quarter of a mile. Now they're at half a mile. The, the, the ringing of the bells became more faint and more faint. And, and then finally, they could barely hear the bells in the background ringing at the church. And, and one of the boys started slowing his horse down. And his friend said, what are you doing? Hold on. We're going this way. And he started to turn his horse around. And he said, no, no, no. I, I, I have to go back while I can still hear the ringing of the bells. Once upon a time, there was a boy who was eating with pigs. And at some point when he was there, he realized that in the very back of his mind, he started to hear a dinner bell ring. And, 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 and it was faint, but he remembered the dinner bell being rung on the ranch of his dad when every time that he and his brother and everyone was out working outside and their mom and their dad had dinner ready and they would come out and ring the bell, boys, it's time for dinner, y'all come on in. Ring, 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 come on in for dinner. And at some point, being with all of those pigs, thank God he had not gotten so far into the meal with the pigs that he couldn't hear the dinner bell ringing to call him back home with his dad. Have any of you thought about how sweet the phrase um, homecoming is lately? Uh, not, not, not going home to your, to your schools, but, but if you picture what are the most sweet homecomings, a soldier perhaps coming back home after a year, two years being away from family, a college student being away for a long time, and now they show up homecoming, coming home for Christmas perhaps. Come home, come home to the table with Jesus. That's the theology here of the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. And I want you to know it is my favorite, favorite parable. You can put it on my tombstone. If anybody ever asks you what is Pastor Ross's favorite parable, you tell them, undeniably, it is the parable of the prodigal son. I love it the most. Uh, Megan and I have some very good friends who are Russian missionaries. Uh, the, the man's name is Slava and uh, he has come here to Marble Falls, come to our church, in fact, and spoken to us here on a Sunday night. I love him and his family. They're so good. The first time that he came a number of years ago, uh, he said that he lived in St. Petersburg. And I said, really? St. Petersburg um, ha has a beautiful painting in a museum there. And he said, are you talking about the return of the prodigal son? I said, yes. In, in 1669, the, the, the great Renaissance painter Rembrandt painted the return of the prodigal son. And, and it's beautiful. I, I, I absolutely love it. And I was telling him about it, and he said, I've seen it. In the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, where Slava lives, the actual Rembrandt painting is there. It's huge, y'all. It's as big as our cross. It's massive, and it is just a gorgeous portrayal of a father who is hugging his son who has come home. Rembrandt just captured it. And... Um, and so Slava and I talked about that and talked about the gospel. He remembered it all these years. We saw Slava and his wife and, and their son two months ago. And they came in from Russia and spent the night with us. And, uh, and I couldn't believe it. He, he brought me a gift from the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia. I'll show it to you. 
It is Rembrandt's Return of the Prodigal Son from Russia. Isn't it gorgeous? Rembrandt, notice what Rembrandt does with the light and the shadows. He plays with light and shadows in a way that, that many artists didn't during that time. And here is the father, of course, and he's hugging his son. And here is the older son, angry and indifferent, looking at all of it. I just think it's fantastic. And um, I, I'm going to frame it and put it in the most noticeable place that I can find. Uh, I, the return of the prodigal son. When y'all read it, how do y'all picture it? This is, this is how I picture it. Um, the story in Luke 15 contains some of our most precious theology about the Lord's Supper and how we do it. So when you and I take the Lord's Supper, you, you need to have in the back of your mind, it is something like Luke 15, and the, the parable of the prodigal, it's like that. And, and, and our precious theology is this, that wherever you are, whoever you are, and whatever you have been doing, you can come back home. That there is a place at the table for you, that if you've sinned, if you feel distant, if whatever, God wants you back. And, and God uses food to do it. We used to do it with youth all the time. He does it well with adults, too. He does it well. The, the food, eating, and meals form us. It forms us all the time. There was a decade-long study at Columbia University a number of years ago that revealed that children that eat four or more meals at home each week with their family are healthier, happier, and more successful in school than children who eat those same meals on the run or by themselves. The meals we eat together play a significant role in our relationships and in our emotional health and mental health. Often when I'm visiting with somebody, a family who has lost a loved one, and I start talking to them about stories so that I can do a funeral well and say the right things, I'll say, tell me about some special memories that you have, and inevitably, every time, they all start talking about special meals. And they'll talk about Thanksgivings and they'll talk about Christmases. You know, they'll, they'll talk about eating this. I remember roasting, you know, my family would, they would say, would always roast marshmallows during Christmas or my family. And it's about this eating thing. And they would talk about food a lot. And, and, and not only would they talk about food in those moments, but, but they said it's, it wasn't just the meal then and I didn't even invite this, they would start going into the special things that that person cooked well. And the family would just say, ah, oh, grandmother's apple pie. Oh, wasn't it so good? And then they look around and say, who has the recipe for that? Don't lose that. We, we talk about food in that same kind of way. You know, you start asking them and you start remembering, who is it that made that special pie? Who is it that could make the special bread? Oh, the special bread, the special pies, all of these things. Y'all, eating and meals and food are all throughout the story of God and us. We are emotionally, mentally, and relationally and spiritually formed when we have meals together. And if you, if you doubt that, I want you to test it like this. If there is anybody in your life that you are slightly at odds with, or you know, you're just not doing well in a relationship, why don't you eat with them once a month? Sit down and be with them during that time, and I promise your attitude slowly will begin to, ch to change. Food and meals together are the basis of what we're talking about, the Lord's Supper. It's not supposed to be, it's a symbol. When we take a piece of bread and a cup, it's actually a symbol of a full meal. God's hope is this, that my goodness, with all the things that tear a church apart, if they could just eat a meal together regularly, they will love each other a whole lot more. The meal 
The food is exceedingly important in all of it. In fact, in Luke 15, there are several uh, meals here in the text. And if you're not careful, you'll miss one of the most important ones. I bet you got the most famous one, though. When you read it, all, all of y'all probably know, if I were to say, where's the big meal in, in, the, in the story? You say, well, when the son comes home, right, the son comes home and the dad, um, the dad kills the good steak, the one with all the marbling, the excellent steak, the very best. That's what he's given to him. And, and, and it's a celebration. Everybody come and have the very best steak you've ever had. That's what we're giving to you, the very, very best. And, you're, and, and, and that's, I love that meal. That's the way the Lord's Supper should be. Come home and share it. I, I love it. But, y'all, that's not the only meal in the story. Where, where's the other meal? It's the one with the pigs. The meal with the pigs is very important, but we miss that one sometimes. Did you notice? Did you notice it's at the trough, not the table, where, where he starts to dream of home again. It's at the trough, not the table, where he starts remembering the love of, of, and the food of the Father. It's at the trough when he finally starts to understand the very, very important truth that you can either have the pig's supper or the Lord's supper, but you can't have both. You got to choose. And often when you choose the Lord's Supper over the pig's supper, it means putting down pride. It means putting down arrogance. It means that you have to start admitting that things don't go well when you're in charge of it all. It means desiring to repent and be tender hearted and loving. It means to, to, to seek forgiveness. And because it requires all of that, that's why going home is sometimes hard. It's difficult. And I, I get it. I get it. I, I, I've resented and, and, and struggled going home to God before because all of the things in my life I, uh, that I need to put down to go back to the Father, I get it. And because it's hard, I, I wonder how long it took for the, this young man to, how many meals did the pigs, with the pigs did he have to eat? How long did it take? I, I don't know. Bon Jovi, my favorite 80s rock star, <laughs> sings a song called, Who Says You Can't Go Home? Now, if, if that song was about being home with God, home with each other in the church, which it's not, but if it was about those things, the answer to his question who says you can't come home? The answer is the devil, Satan. And he says it all the time, that when you're distant from God and you think, ah, I think I want to go back, the devil will say, you can't go back home. You're too far gone. You can't go back to your church. You can't get plugged back in. You are too far gone to go back and be intimate with all these people again. You can't. You can't go back home there is a very real and palpable power, a force that's trying, that will stop at nothing to keep you all and to keep me disconnected from the Lord and disconnected from each other and disconnected from anything that's lovely and anything that's hopeful and anything that's loving. And so what we do is the forces of pride and, and other sins we just invest more and more in them. And y'all, the forces of pride and other sins can become so incredibly strong, so strong that people end up choosing to stay with the pigs and they keep eating with them. In fact, in fact, you can eat with the pigs for so long that the food of the pigs starts to taste normal. And it's like, oh, this is okay. And you forget what the steak with the father ever even tasted like. You can forget and, and, and that the dinner bells of the Father are ringing for you to come back home. And, and, and you think, no, I think I'm good. I think I'm good here because the food of the pigs has started to be normal for you. For instance, uh, it, like the man, 
like the older brother who was just so angry about all of it that he couldn't come in and taste the party and be a part of all of it, like the angry brother. I think of that. And in our world today, in our culture, everywhere you look, the sin of anger has become so much a part of somebody's DNA and their life and their very skin, it seems, that it's just kind of who they are. You can't talk to them without them running something down and choosing to be angry, that there is nothing of joy and loving and loveliness at all in their mind anymore. Anger is not bitter any longer. Anger tastes just fine. Just fine. And if you want a litmus test to test whether or not anger tastes just fine to you, then, then Christians are doing this, and I've seen it. The angry Christians... Angry Christians begin manipulating even Jesus Christ so that Jesus justifies their anger so that when they close their eyes in worship or close their eyes in prayer, the Jesus that they see is the Jesus who is turning over tables first and foremost. The Jesus turning over tables is their favorite Jesus. They love that Jesus. That Jesus has sadly risen to the top of their doctrine in almost a heretical kind of way. Not the Jesus who is a lamb of God. Not the Jesus who sits on a cross and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Not the Jesus who says, blessed are the peacemakers. Not the Jesus who says, Peter, put away your sword. Not the Jesus who says, love your neighbor. And very much not the Jesus who says, love your enemy. Not that at all. Sadly, they have allowed an, this other thing to rise to the top, and they say, ah, you see, that's why I get to be mad at everybody and, and create this odd doctrine thing where a very shallow, very shallow, a centimeter thick kind of theological argument about how even God is happy about their anger and they've lived in the ugliness, the ugliness for so long, it feels normal to them to do so. It now is just a part of who they are. That is when the pig's food tastes fine to you and me. And you know, all sins can be that way. You lust, lust so much that you can't even imagine a life without lust or pornography. It's drinking so much that you can't even imagine what life would be without it. Jesus is saying here to everybody that no matter what the, pig, the pig's food has been for you, there is a better way. And he invites you, for the love of God, come home. Come home. Please put it all away. Who all, who all needs that kind of homecoming? There are some people like, like, like the prodigal son who used to be home a long time ago. But now he has found a way to go back and he remembers what it was like to be home and how happy he used to be and how joyful he was. For some of you here, you used to be home a long time ago, but you're not anymore. You used to be closer to the Lord than you are now, big time. And God's saying, please, please, please come home. If you even get up, even the slightest way to move toward me, I will run toward you. Come home. There are other people, though, and, and they never knew what home was to begin with. And maybe the question has come into their mind every once in a while. They, they, they think, my goodness, is this place where I am all that there is? Is this situation that I'm in, is that all that there is? Is not there a, a, a better table for me to eat at? Am I forced to eat in this situation and, and, and live this life forever? Is there anything else? And then they begin to hear stories, perhaps, of these people called Christians or that church over there who love people and care for people, and then they wonder, am I welcome at their table? Do you think that I could go and eat with their Jesus as well and see if, if it's for me? The table for Je of Jesus is for both, the person who is distant from God and the person who has never been close to God in your whole life. He's for both. But y'all, it's also, the table is also for the son who never left the one 
the very one who gets maddest um, about all of the people that the father has invited back to the table. He says, what? My, my, my brother is invited to the table? Now, a story kind of ends there, but somebody that angry, they're mad about everybody, I bet. What? The servants? The servants are invited to the table too? What? The neighbors down the road who, who kill our sheep and steal our cows, they're invited to the table. What? The, the distant relatives that dad I know you don't even like, they're invited to the table too? And the dad says, yes, because you got to understand, lives are changed at my table. Luke 15, in this text, the Lord's Supper is a homecoming. It is a yes on top of a yes on top of a yes for everybody. Because, y'all, in this story, it really was never about the son to begin with. It was always about the father. Always a father who forgives, a father who is generous, a father who provides, a father who cares, a father who opens his home and his heart that we might have hope. A father. And that, my friends, is how Jesus pictures all of this Lord's Supper business with a great invitation to them. So let me ask all of you as we close, where is your home? Where do you feel most at home? Where are you the most relaxed and feel comfortable? First Peter says that you should not feel comfortable in all the things of this world, that you are exiles, aliens, pilgrims, that, that this world is uncomfortable in a lot of ways to you, meaning we are never, ever truly at home in the things of this society. And the closer we get to God, the more uncomfortable we are in all of these things. And we start to realize that, that no, no worldly idea is perfect for us. And there may be some worldly ideas and some things that they're close, yes. I, I, I get involved a little bit with them because they're close to the kingdom of God. And then something is said, something is tweaked, something moves, and you're like, ah, that thing that I thought was good is still not godly. It's not godly. I'm still uncomfortable in all of it. Y'all, that's why the world's best, best philosophies, the world's best politics, the world's best idols, the world's best successes, without Jesus, it's all just eating with the pigs. All of it. And that's why the Lord wants you all to come home, come home, to something better than all of that. And if you do, he says, if you just, if you get up from a moment and put that aside, and if you have the courage to do so, just stepping out for a moment, if you will come this way, I will run and meet you where you are because I have been watching and waiting for you. Will you bow your heads with me? This morning... This morning, if you feel like you are the prodigal in a way, or if you feel like you need to put something down, something that's all-consuming in your mind and in your heart, you got to put it down. Or maybe you don't know Jesus at all, and you're a youth, and you've never given your life to him. You've never been baptized like we saw this morning. Your God is calling to you now. And he's saying, I love you. Come and give your life to me. Meet me here at the Lord's Supper. Wherever you are, now is your time for a homecoming church to share in all of it. As our deacons come forward and get everything ready, the music is going to start playing right now. And I want you to take just a moment. I want you to think about holding this bread that's broken for you and, and, and tasting the cup that's poured out for you. Really think about it just for a moment. I'm going to pray for us in a minute, but right now, I just want you to think about that. Would you do that as they get this ready?
We're gonna have stations all along the front. And there's plenty of room up here at the table, plenty of room for you. We're gonna try to do it safely as well. I want you to know that, that, that all of our deacons have gloves on. None of your hands are going to be in all of this. They're gonna take it out special and put it in your hand. And their glove is the only thing that will touch it. So hopefully it's safe as well. And I want you to come and I want you to hold it. They're going to say, this is my body, which is for you. This is the cup put up for you. And I want you to pray and thank God and go back if you want to. Take it to your seat. And when you are ready, then you eat it and you drink it. But as we begin this, I want you to know that, that this, this symbolizes Christ's body, which was broken on the cross for you. And he wants you to do this remembering him. And the cup symbolizes his blood, which is poured out for you. It represents the new covenant, a new covenant of grace and mercy poured out for you. And you can take that and remember the Lord as well. But as you're also up here doing it, look to see who's around you. Look in the line. You can talk to each other. You can be together. If you see somebody you haven't seen, you, 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 you can. You can go up and talk and say, hi, this is the, 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 the table. Would you all come and have a meal with me? Come and have a meal up here at the table. Homecoming, would you come? Dear Lord Jesus.